Hey everybody, I'm back. Episode 2 of Season 2. Last week's episode seemed to get a lot of attention. Uh, I had a lot of conversations, a lot of comments. And that's great. That's what I'm hoping for. I think it's important that we have these conversations and then we can respectfully disagree with one another and maybe come up with new ideas. And all the comments kind of boil down to four different sections that I'm going to cover in this video. Uh, one, you sound like a cranky old man. Two, this is working because vegans. Three, if you're so smart, why don't you tell us how we should be doing things? And four, we can't just get rid of AV and save because it's too big and it's too popular. I'm gonna try to answer all four of those things. Let's do it. watch the first episode you really should i'm gonna drop it this area yeah. pretty much everything i talk about i'll put in links down below and you can click through and read whatever you want so let's get underway to be quite honest the first one i found a little confusing uh there was multiple people that were like you sound like a cranky old man telling us how things used to be in the old days well no sh the YouTube channels call it the Cranky Vegan. The Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, that's all the same thing. Cranky Vegan, Cranky, yeah. I mean, it's, it's my shtick. It's what I do. You know, I can't help it. Sometimes I get cranky. And I talk about it on YouTube. What do you want from me? Now I am cranky. But for real. The second point that people brought up a lot was Anonymous for the Voiceless, Cuba Truth, the SAVE movement, it's working. And my response is always, well, how do you know it's working? Most common response is, because there's more vegans. And here's links to the studies that indicate that that's happening. But then I started looking into these statistics and these studies a little bit more. The one that everyone's pointing to now in England that says 3.5 million people are vegan. But this study was done by a company that produces two for one restaurant coupons. I, I mean, and this is the statisticians that we're relying on for our information. And what I found kind of in the small print of the study done by this two for one restaurant coupon company um, was that a lot of the people they spoke to said vegans also eat butter, they eat eggs, and they also eat fish. So it really comes no surprise that like, yeah, there's 3.5 million vegans in England and some of them eat fish and butter and eggs. But you look at, um, you know, the poll by the Vegan Society who polled 10,000 people, again, the Vegan Society, and they found that there's 542,000 vegans in, in England. To me, that seems like a number and a poll that I would more rely on. Not because I want there to be less vegans, but because I think that's a better way to gauge our abilities to be effective. When I hear people say, well, it's working because there's more vegans, I want it to be true, I'm not so sure it is. And the people that do polls and surveys professionally, I think also disagree with you. That, to me, that seems like a really important takeaway. Three, we're moving right along. You know, a lot of people have to say, if you're so smart, tell us what we need to be doing. To be honest with you, I don't know. If I had blueprints for an effective campaign around the world that we could all participate in or each, you know, individual country or city, I, it's not, I'm not trying to keep these things secret, like I would tell you. But like I said in my last video, I don't think we should be picking away at the individuals because I don't think the individuals are the problem. It's the system, the industries, the corporate operations, the roots of the issue. These are the things we need to start digging up. And I think we do that by doing pressure campaigns. Look up pressure campaigns, look up corporate campaigning. But that being said, I'll give you some examples of organizations and campaigns that I thought were really inspiring. These campaigns that were going on, they're called the breeder campaigns. And there were people in, in England that were doing focused pressure campaigns where they were picking one place and they were going to protest it until it shut down. Over the course of several years, they were remarkably good at it. They shut down Consort Beagle Breeder and turned over 200 dogs to animal rights activists. You had Hellgrove Cat Farm. They shut that place down in 18 months with protest. Um, and that place turned over 800 cats to activists around the, around the country. They shut down Regal Rabbits, which was a rabbit farm breeding rabbits for vivisection. They shut that place down in seven days and they got 1,200 rabbits out of that place. They shut down the Shamrock Primate Farm um, in 12 months, closing the last uh, breeding facility for primates in all of England. I mean, they were just shutting these places down one by one by one. Those people in England eventually went on to start the Shack Campaign, which was an international pressure campaign to shut down one of the world's largest animal testing laboratories. The campaign spread to 18 different countries, tens of thousands of people participating in it around the world. It was highly successful getting over a hundred of the largest corporations of their kind to uh, divest um, from this laboratory. I mean, it was a massive, powerful campaign. 
that utilized a lot of different tactics and a lot of different strategies to get the things that they wanted. And whenever I talk about Shaq and the Breeder campaigns, everyone says those were amazing, but they're radical. And we can't always be doing rad radical activism, and I agree with you. So to that end, here's a few more um, organizations and campaigns which I found really inspiring and were successful. Well, in the United States, there's been a long-standing campaign against uh, animals and circuses. Um, and after people protesting and educating and, and doing direct action and civil disobedience, um, some folks in Oakland, California got the bull hook to be banned, which is, of course, the, the rod with the hook on the end that the trainers used to beat elephants um, into submission. But the people had a very smart strategy. You get rid of the bull hook, then the circuses can't bring elephants anymore. If you can't bring the elephants, then the circus is eventually going to collapse. They got the bull hook banned. And suddenly cities around the country started following suit. The oldest and biggest circus in the world closed down for good. Another great example of grassroots activists using smart strategies and tactics to win um, is one of my favorite organizations and people um, in Sweden. And they're called Dijuratesalens. I don't know. I don't speak Swedish, I'm sorry. And they've run a lot of different exciting campaigns. One of them being a campaign against a chinchilla farm, um, the last chinchilla farm in all of Sweden. They ran a really strong campaign against this farm. They put everything into it and they said they were gonna stick to it till it closed, and it did. And over 300 chinchillas were turned over to animal rights activists. And it was the last chinchilla farm, and now it's gone. And there's no more chinchilla farms in all of Sweden. That's amazing. It was people doing smart campaigning and using smart tactics and getting the job done. The same organization has got over 100 restaurants to stop serving foie gras. They've got a bunch of stores to go for free in Sweden. On top of all of that, they organize a super successful vegan fest. They're doing everything. They're using all sorts of tools from the toolbox and they're getting the victories that they need. To me, that's really inspiring. Another one of my favorites is Hafnar, a farm sanctuary outside of Zurich in Switzerland. I think does amazing things. They do like incredible amount of vegan outreach and talking to people, but at the same time, they're doing these really interesting campaigns where they're helping farms that use animals turn into sanctuaries. Like what an amazing concept. Why aren't we doing this more often? I actually did an interview with, with Sarah, who's like this unstoppable force of energy. Just watching her day to day is like just exhausting enough for me. Finally, um, one other great example is an organization in New Zealand um, called Direct Animal Action. It's started by three women and are just like doing really smart s strategic stuff. They got various campaigns going on against a variety of poultry farms. They also have a campaign against uh, the rodeo. But the exciting thing um, that I like about Direct Animal Action beyond just the fact that they're like going after places and they're trying to stop them, they're working with the community. They're not telling the community what to do, rather they're in service to the community. Um, and I think that paid off in a really big way. So like for instance, in October of 2018, they joined um, a local community who was trying to stop um, this mega farm from opening up in their community. So Teagle, Teagle, I don't know how to pronounce it, um, but this company was trying to open this mega factory farm in this community where they would have 1.3 million chickens. And the local community didn't want it for a variety of reasons, not just animal issues, but also for health issues and environmental issues. And Direct Animal Action worked to support the community, and together they fought back and they won. And the mega farm never was even opened. And to me, like their statement, and let me just read it, it says, we help the local community to resist Teagle because we want to see an end to factory farming and we believe that multinational corporations should not be allowed to bulldoze over local communities. That's perfect. That's exactly what we all should be doing. That's what we should all be fighting for. In my mind, the more mega farms and slaughterhouses we can stop from even being built just means there's less places for us that we have to stand in front of and watch animals be brought in to be slaughtered. To me, that's the win. And that leads me to the final thing people kept saying, like, Anonymous for the Voiceless is too big. Save is too big. We just can't, like, do you just want us to abandon these things? Absolutely not. There's loads and loads of people doing lots of work in those spaces. But could you imagine if we just shifted the focus slightly on what Anonymous for the Voiceless and what SAVE was doing? It's not to say that you shouldn't continue to do vegan outreach. What happens if you couple that with an important campaign? You know, everyone's standing in a cube holding laptops. What happens if the videos weren't just about animal agriculture, but also were about something specific against a specific company, a specific target, all the cubes of truth we're doing around the world, that all the save movement around the world we're all working on together. Anonymous for the Voiceless could be saying, also, sign this petition, send an email to this corporation, 
sign up for our mailing list. 30 minutes from now, we're all gonna meet over here and we're gonna have a demonstration against this company. You're all holding laptops anyways. Just flip on a hotspot, let them send an email right from the computer. If it's true that Anonymous for the Voiceless is a thousand chapters around the world and Save has 500 chapters around the world, which is amazing, tip of the hat. Could you imagine if they all started focusing on the same corporation? and got thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people to email, to petition, to, to protest against these corporations. It doesn't have to be an either or. It doesn't have to be campaigning or vegan outreach. It doesn't have to be campaigning or education. In fact, some of the most important parts of all the campaigns I just mentioned were the education component, but the education component was geared towards that specific campaign. It didn't mean it drove people away from the idea of veganism, but it embraced both of those concepts. So what would that look like for Save Movement, for instance, just to shift slightly? In February of 2018, um, Kentucky Fried Chicken in England shifted their supply chain from one corporation to the other, basically. And like something happened with the refrigeration units, I can't remember. And because of that, um, 450 Kentucky Fried Chickens around England couldn't get their dead chickens, and they shut down for several days. 450 Kentucky Fried chickens shut down overnight. Could you imagine that if the save movement just shifted from um, watching animals being brought in to be killed to coming up the supply chain? Tactically, you'd be doing the same thing. And in this article, it's really interesting because they say, this is like an industry insider magazine, it says even a short-term supply disruption can have deep impacts on operating margins. A short-term supply. That's like every save demonstration. Can you imagine if you all focused on the same corporation at the same time and disrupted it around an entire country or around the globe? You could shut places down. And at the same time, you had a thousand anonymous for the voiceless organizations doing demonstrations against the same corporation, doing emails, doing petitions, you know, gumming up the system that way. At the same time, educating people about what the, what the campaign was about and the broader issues. Like think of how like much more successful you could be. And you could be focusing on educating people about lifestyle change. You could do all of it at the same time, but you could also have real world tangible goals and successes. That picking away at the individual and trying to change the world one person at a time, I don't think it works. But if you disrupt the business or a corporation, say Kentucky Fried Chicken, where 450 Kentucky Fried Chickens closed overnight, it doesn't matter how many people want to eat chicken if they can't actually go to the restaurant and get it. We're creative, we're smart. So let's use those ideas, let's use that creativity, let's use those tools to make a much stronger and more exciting, successful movement. Because when we're successful, people want to be part of that winning team. They want to feel those successes and they want to stick around. And when they want to stick around, that means they stay vegan longer and they stay activist longer. And not only is that a win for our movement, more importantly, that's a win for the animals. In the meantime, I'm going to continue to be cranky. I'm going to do it on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Turn on the notifications, subscribe, do all that fun stuff, and I will see you on Thursday.